pleasure to be here and to start this panel. Well, I come to the question of technology and humanity with a very recent research experience in mind. Um, after writing Alone Together uh, and finishing Alone Together, a book that I completed in 2011, uh, my ears were kind of ringing uh, with a question. It was a question that I hadn't been able to address in that book, which was about the early days of social media. And that question was this, that so many people had said to me as I wrote that book, I'd rather text than talk. I'd mm. rather text than talk. And by text, they meant not just texting, they meant G-chat, they meant email, they meant you know, being on the screen for communication in a variety of different ways. Mm. And um, not just young people, not just young people, but older people, businessmen, lawyers, doctors, who'd rather look at their screens than their patients, uh, people of all walks of life and of all ages. Now, as a social scientist and as a psychologist, I know the work that conversation can do. For individuals, it's the place where intimacy and empathy are born and developed. And for organizations, it's the place where collaboration, where passion, where creativity happen and are nurtured. It could not be more important. So um, the ability to put yourself in the place of the other, both for individuals and in organizations, that empathic dance um, is central to our individual and social lives. Um, so for the individual, it's crucial for empathy, for child development, for organizations, it's good for the bottom line, productivity, engagement, and creativity increase. So with this, I'd rather text than talk ringing in my ears, um, I set out to explore the role of conversation in digital culture. I was kind of like the energizer bunny to figure out what was really happening, when people said that they would rather keep their communications online, number one, did they mean it? And number two, if they meant it, what really were the consequences? Because face-to-face -face conversation is the most human and humanizing thing that we do. So what were the headlines of my investigation into this question. Headline, when people say that they'd rather text than talk, that they'd rather stay at their screens, they meant it. Indeed, we had come almost to what I called a flight from conversation, at least from the kind of conversations where people are spontaneous, um, where things are open-ended, where people allow ideas to bounce off, where they're vulnerable and present. Otherwise put, people are so busy connecting that they often aren't communicating on the things that really matter. A second headline, with all of that, we're in deep conflict about our ways of communicating. And that conflict for me is, is captured in a recent statistic that 89% of Americans took out a smartphone during their last social interaction, took out a smartphone during their last social interaction, and 82% said that it decreased the quality of the conversation that they're in. In other words, we're all doing something that we know somehow deteriorates the quality of the relationships that we're in. So here are two vignettes that capture this moment of discomfort, and I argue because I'm, I'm going first because I'm considered the most optimistic on our panel. Um, here are two vignettes that capture our discomfort, but are my optimism because I think that we're in an unstable state where I think we are ready for a change because we sense that something is deeply amiss. And my first example, my first vignette, comes from my world, which is the world of education. I'm a professor at MIT. My students don't want to come to office hours anymore. 
They used to. I'm really an office hours kind of professor. I like to talk to them, I like to get involved with them. And I ask them why, and they don't say it's because I'm intimidating or distant or unavailable. They say that they want to write me a perfect email, and they want, with their question, and they want me to write them a perfect email in response. In other words, their model of what, this, of what should happen between a student and a professor is a transactional, not a relational model. A transactional, not a relational model. And anyone here who loves knowledge, who's been lit up by a teacher, knows that it was not because they tried to be perfect, it was rather because they sat with someone who cared about them with an imperfect product, and that teacher said, this isn't perfect, but I'm going to be here for you tomorrow, and we will make it better. When are you coming back? There was a relationship. More than that, it had to do with something like the transference, what psychoanalysts call the transference, where the student gets to know the relation, gets to know the professor, is in a, in a relationship with the professor, and says to themselves, I wonder if I could be like her. I wonder if I could be like him. Could I grow up to do that? This isn't going to happen in an email. You need a conversation for that. And our students, in their fear of vulnerability, in their desire to be perfect, in their desire to put this on screens where they won't be vulnerable and they can be perfect, because they've been raised to be perfect and to shy away from vulnerability, are shying away from that. A second story from business. I spoke with lawyers who told me that they would rather stay alone in their office than meet with colleagues. They lay out their phones, usually several, have several computers in front of them, put on their headphones, and do as much as possible on Skype or through emails. Their colleagues refer to all these headphones and gears and call them pilots in their cockpits. But in one law firm filled with all these pilots in their cockpits, the partners actually did a study and determined that it was the lawyers who went out and met with clients and colleagues who brought the most money into the firm. So this story caused me to ask those pilots, why, why do you stay in your office? Why don't you go out, given what you know, what will really make things work? And here's the kind of answer I got about why they flee conversation. Conversation, I'll tell you what's wrong with conversation. It takes place in real time, and you can't control what you're going to say. Online, we can control our time, we can edit ourselves to get things right, we can retouch. But in our passion to get things right, we forget that we don't come together. We don't come together in a place like this to hear each other get things exactly right. We want to listen to each other think. We want to listen to each other think. And that's what's wrong with staying at our screens instead of giving ourselves the opportunity to come together and listen to each other think. You know, author's choice, my favorite line in my new book, Reclaiming Conversation, about how it's time to reclaim this most human thing, is that technology makes us forget what we know about life. And that's where these stories lead us. We're distracted at our dinner tables, in our living rooms, at our business meetings, in our classrooms. We find traces of a new silent spring which is the term that Rachel Carson coined when we were ready to see that with technological change, there had come an assault on our environment. And now technology has brought us to another assault, this time an assault on empathy. A brilliant study found that there's been a 40% decline in empathy among college students over the past 20 years, with most of it coming in the past 10 years which is something that the researchers attributed to the presence of devices. And the researchers, after doing that study, were so depressed 
that they turned their attention to creating empathy apps. <laughs> empathy apps for the iPhone. And in conclusion, I just want to say <clears throat> that in all of the professions for kids growing up, in romance, business, healthcare, you know, we face this empathy gap, but we are the empathy app. We are the empathy app. So it's time to look up, look at each other, and start the conversation. Thank you very much.